here is how it all started. If you had told me even nine, ten years ago that I would be standing here talking about my life for the last eight years in remote India, down in filthy, decrepit, ancient pits, I would have just thought, no, no, this is a parallel universe. That's not me. That's a different Victoria. And yet here I am, um, you know, 30 years, 30 plus years after I saw my first step well, it's great to talk to a group of people who are so educated in Asian art. Many of you have been to India a dozen times, but I am one of maybe three experts in the world on this topic, so you won't know anything. <laughs> and it is fantastic. And even if you think you know something, that's great. Anybody who's seen a step well, I bow down to you. But Nobody knows this stuff because it's insane. It's really hard to get your hands on this material, which is why I decided ultimately to write a book about it. So here's what happened on my first trip to India now almost 35 years ago. Uh, I was on an architectural tour all over the country. At one point in the trip, we were in Ahmedabad, and uh, the driver I was using uh, said, oh, I want to take you to see something, uh, the Queen Stepwell. What are you even talking about? At the time, this is outside of Ahmedabad, uh, about half an hour, and there was no grass, there was no radio tower, there were no trees. It was this dusty, deserty, Gujarati area, and he just said, get out and walk to that wall, which just, the whole experience was surreal. And then I looked over the wall, and you do not expect, we're trained in architecture, we're used to an architecture looking up. Look at that building, oh, look at that house over there. We are not used to looking down into a structure. And at that moment, and I studied architecture, I'd seen a lot of architecture, it felt so transgressive almost. It was disorienting. I could not see the bottom of this thing. I could not understand what any part of this was. It was just as though a man-made chasm had opened up beneath me. Just by, just by looking over that. Okay, so, but, and I'm gonna try and recreate the process of this, although at the time there were no people in it. It was, I can't describe to you how shocking it was to be in the middle of nowhere going into a structure from 1500. I didn't know it then. And you begin to go down these steps. Um, and this is a very ornate one. I wanna just start out by saying it's six stories underground. Uh, the whole nature of step wells is that they're subterranean. That is the form of architecture we're not used to, except possibly going into a subway station. So keep your eye on the ground level here. Once you get into this step well, but it's what happens in every step well, particularly in Gujarat, your senses become enlivened because all of a sudden you realize, not that you're just going down into the earth, which is a profound experience anyway, you're penetrating the ground. But also, as you go down, your views begin to shift. You can't get a handle on the distance. And the farther down you go, the surroundings change, the din of India, which if you've been there, you're familiar with honking, screaming, carrying on, bleeding of animals. It becomes hushed. And the light begins to become diffuse. And the surroundings become, uh, instead of the dry, hot air, become very cool. So you're study, suddenly entering a world of opposites. There's this shifting view. You just can't tell how far you're going. These columns are towering up above you, six stories, until you reach the bottom. And you can see how dark and diffuse and mysterious it is. There's a little bit of water still in a dollage. And you look up. That's the ground level up at the top, all the way up there. 
It's an extraordinary experience, and um, exactly how it would have been experienced 500 years ago by the people who proceeded down into this, and it is transformative. I was talking to a, a lady before this about how it does feel like you're going into another world, and it does. There's nothing that I ever felt, still, that can duplicate that experience, which is why it remained for over 30 years indelible, so powerful, and yet it took me so many decades of going back to India before I had a chance to actually explore that memory. I began to go to India, well, I went almost every year. I became, you know, one of these people who just could not get enough of it. And finally, when my son went to college eight years ago, I decided that instead of trying to get India out of my system, I was going to consciously try and get it into my system. And I started going for three months, you know, and I had already traveled a little bit on my own. It was a huge adventure, and it was difficult. But I had uh, researched three stories before I went with no idea what would happen. The stepwells are the one that became the obsession of my life. So what is a stepwell? I just wanted to give you an idea of what that experience was like. Very, like on the most superficial level, they're uh, water harvesting systems in a country that is dry for maybe nine or ten months out of the year, followed by a deluge of the monsoon rains. This was um, a, the most precious resource that you had to um, preserve as long as possible. And during the dry seasons, where you there really wasn't any surface water, water could be. 13 stories underground, that's where the water table was. You had to be able to reach it, guarantee that you can reach even that trickle of the water table at the hottest times of year. So the only way to really do that effectively and efficiently was to dig a well shaft first and then dig stairs, this long corridor with steps in order to reach the bottom most. This is where the water table would be. And then as the rains came and the water table became engorged, the water could fill all the way up to here, sometimes to the top. It was a brilliant system, uh, and it worked for almost 1,500 years. This is what, this is, I don't really have a great photograph of what it's like when these things really fluctuate, but this is uh, in Delhi, where there are 20 step wells you can go and see but nobody really does. And you can see how this is a very old one from the 13th century. This is low ebb, this is high ebb, high f whatever. I don't think you can say high ebb. Uh, but anyway, so that was the major purpose of Stepwell. But they were also the most multifunctional structures of their day and performed so many other important, uh, filled so many other roles. Uh, and, and for Hindus in particular, um, step wells were a very important subterranean temples um, or uh, places where you could go and uh, have do prayers. Uh, they could just be even as simple as a niche dedicated um, to a deity. These are some really interesting ones where you see various offerings. This is a very old step well and it's just got a couple of niches where people still actively go and pray. They were also really important social centers for women in particular, whose job it was, and still is everywhere in the world, to go and get water, sometimes twice a day. Uh, you know, today they have to walk miles to do it, and it's never a guy, sorry men, but this is always women's work. It was a very constrained, uh, it still is for most Indian women, you had a very constrained life where you really didn't get to socialize, you had to stay at home. and do become the homemaker and raising the children. So going to a step well once or twice a day would have been a very social experience. It still is at these wells, but uh, back then it was a very important part of their life. Another interesting feature of step wells that people often aren't aware of is that they were important charitable gifts for the community. They were expensive to commission. They could take 25 years to build the most elaborate ones. And if you wanted to be a benefactor, if you wanted your name to live on, which in 99% of the cases it doesn't, but you would commission a step well and give it to your community. 25% of these, we think, 
Everything is we think. There's nothing you can possibly prove about step wells except that we don't know anything. 25% were commissioned by women. Um, and you can often tell this by the names, if it's Rani, Queen, obviously, or if it's got a woman's name, like the one on the left, that's uh, Murtanaji. She was a, a, not royal, like a Rani, but she was a wealthy woman who commissioned this in honor of her husband, and that's why women were doing it predominantly. They were commissioning these in honor of their dead husbands. Um, the one on the right is called um, Rani Bauli, uh, Another really important feature of the step wells is that they were built along trade routes where having water within a day's ride in these arid communities, I mean, you could just, you would die otherwise. You had to have a place where you could hole up, water your animals, rest. And when I was, I'm going to tell some personal stories in here, which I don't get to do. I've never shown this fellow Kimabai. Um, in Gujarat, where the oldest step wells are, I'll show you one of those in a minute. Um, it was really important. There were a lot of these out in the hinterlands, but they're really hard to find. Um, and people just don't know where they are. The government doesn't know where they are. But if you have an idea that there's one somewhere, you have to just keep asking everybody, a taxi driver, a farmer, a kid on the street. Sometimes you get really lucky. I got really lucky. I was looking for a step well. There was this random guy in the middle of this town of like eight blocks where they had no idea if they even had step wells there, even though it was in the middle of town. This fellow overheard my driver, you know, saying, Bowley, 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 which means, you know, step well, step well, where are they? Kimabai, who is part of the local Rabari clan, they are, um, their tribe, a kind of uh, wandering nomadic tribe in India, and you recognize them by their costumes. He said, he was a goat herd, and he said, he would take us to one. We put him in our car with this, this marvelous man. And he actually had a pretty subst uh, substantial limp. We get out the side of the road. Kimabai just takes off like through the underbrush. This is just the last part of it. I could barely keep up with the guy. And there is this step well, very early step well. This is one of the early ones from roughly 600. And there it is. Um, and he immediately did what the people would have done in the year 600, go down the steps, clear off the top of the water, and take a drink. Afterwards, yeah, that one was probably OK, although the water can be really toxic in India. But you know, the guys, unless he's actually 30, and we can't tell that from, I, I think he's older than that. That is not a 30-year-old, but you know, maybe toxic water. He's been in pretty good shape, this guy. Then he took me to his village and introduced me to the head of his clan in that wonderful lavender outfit. Oh my god, I wanted that so badly. And I stayed there. The sun was going down, and I had tea with these fellows. It was a pretty amazing experience. This is the kind of thing that can happen if you go off the beaten track, which most of you have done. When they're out in the countryside, uh, or even in the city, when they were used for travelers, um, they were also used for shade outside and even inside the cities where it could get really uh, hot, it can be 120 degrees in Gujarat and even in Delhi now, the, you know, you've been reading about the heat waves. So it was important to be able to get shade. And um, in, Gujar oops, in Gujarat in particular, you see these, um, just these cooling huts, basically, that are built onto the top of these step wells. And sometimes when they go down many levels, you saw on the other ones, you could rest and get away from the hot sun. Um, once, and these were the, specifically the Hindu wells. But once you got into the Islamic style, they actually built these uh, apartments where you could, you know, spend the day, spend several days, and it was, you can feel that at least 10 degrees cooler in those areas, which makes a difference. Now, step wells come in a vast variety of designs. No two are alike. They're like fingerprints, which is one of the wonderful treasure discoveries about them. You never really know what you're going to see. They can be very small and intimate, like the one on the left, or so big that you cannot 
believe it. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm not paying attention. I'm so excited when I talk about this. Um, and you can see, like, here's a person, and we'll take a better look at that step in a minute. They can be incredibly simple with absolutely no adornment at all, but still extraordinarily beautiful and impressive. Um, or we've already seen one of the very ornate ones, but just the, the carving is just, you, you can't believe what you're seeing. It's so detailed. They come in so many different shapes. The most uh, common one is this linear form, was the easiest, you just like dig a straight trench. There are many of these. L-shaped, which is also uh, not uncommon, but there's no explanation. Nobody really has come up with an idea of why they're like that. It's not, ge it's not geological, it's not that they're trying to get around a rock. It, it really nobody seems to know, but it's a, a prevalent design style. This one on the left is one of the early ones. Again, very close to that other step where the Kimabai took me to, from about 600. And the one on the left is from uh, probably about the um, 16th century, near Fatapur Sikri, where probably a number of you have been. Round, you see that a lot. Big round, small round. Um, square, and really eccentric. This one on the left is just one of the strangest I've ever seen. I can't even understand why the steps are like that. And you often get, oh, it looks like Escher. Yes, these look like Escher. Um, or you get this octagonal shape, which is rare, but you do see that. There's another style of step wells, which is actually, um, you know, I'm just wondering, is there any way to turn off those bright lights back there? Is there any way to do it? For some reason, I'm feeling really hot. Plus, I don't think you need them, and I sure don't. <laughs> my raking light on my face right now is making me upset. A kund is a form that is defined really by its steps, the pattern of steps, and its depth. And if you can't turn them off, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. Um, they can go down much faster because they're incredibly steep. And they're always rectilinear, square, or uh, oblong but they are really, really dramatic. You cannot take a bad picture of a quind because they're so extraordinary and sculptural. And the, the pattern of stairs can be, it's always pyramidal in some form. You've always got this um, you know, triangular shape, but it can be small, it can be huge. But you can see that going down those, as precarious as any step will is, these are crazy. It's, it's scary to go down them. I went down every one of these, mainly on my behind, but still. Just, and that's the cover of my book on the left. It's, you know, really the most beautiful thing in, in Jodhpur. This one on the right, like so many step wells, um, they're in areas that are often within steps of tourist destinations. And the one on the right is on the road up and down to the Amur Fort in, uh, in uh, Jaipur. It's literally on the road, but there's a wall. And unless you look over walls like I did, you wouldn't see it. It's nobody, people just miss it all the time. I've gotten, it's like Pavlovian now. I'm always looking over walls. Uh, and then most of the time there's nothing there, but sometimes you see something like this. Uh, this is a quint that I love to show just because it's so eccentric and, and almost um, ominous looking to me. I've never seen another one like this. This is in Varanasi. And, uh, you know, again, it's such a surprising thing because you're not expecting something that steep, that deep, and there's no age that can be put on this. It's finding the age, the, the date, of any of these is really so speculative. And I, I'm not a scholar of India at all. Um, I've seen enough step wells now to sometimes hazard a guess. But even when you look at the material that exists from actual scholars, there can be a 300 year range of dates. And so in my book, and this is the only question mark, because I just thought I can't hazard a guess. I think I put 1,000 in some place. Uh, maybe in the book, because it's only described as very old. And when you say very old in one of the oldest continually lived in cities on the planet, 
what your guess is as good as mine. Um, anyway, the dates are always problematic. Now, Lolark Kund, um, Lolark is uh, an aspect of a deity that is as, uh, associated with fertility, which many, many, many of these step wells are and dedicated to particular deities who, if you pray to, you get pregnant and have a male child. You're never trying to get pregnant with a girl child in India. You know, that's the way it is. Once a year during the monsoon, there's a festival and thousands of couples come to Varanasi, make their way to that steep, insane step well and struggle down the steps to dip in that water and throw in um, some kind of an offering, often very expensive gold jewelry, uh, vegetables and fruit that you swear that you will give up for an entire year if you get pregnant, and then you leave your wet clothes on the steps, which you can see here, even though this is not during the festival, but you leave your wet clothes behind, and can you just imagine, at least you can't fall because there's people on every side of you, but walking down those steps is, is scary. So that kind of sets up what a step well is and the range of them. I just know a little bit about the history. Um, that too is, as with everything, not completely understood. We believe that the precursors of the actual step wells, the, um, the earliest step wells were rock cut and they were between maybe three and 500 or four and 600 AD. And these are not, um, these are examples of what a rock cut steppe would be like. They're not really structural, but these aren't, um, this one is not as old as it, as it looks, but you can see how it's just cut directly into the stone. And this was not a hard one to go down, although the steps on the right, you can see how this limestone is just totally eroded. Um, and then all the way down to the pool at the end. But then with, by 600, you get the first structural step wells. The earliest ones we found are in Gujarat, in this town, Donk, and it was outside of Donk where I met Kimabai while I was searching for this particular step well, Manjushri. And you can see that, you know, it's almost tentative, these small, small blocks. It's very, very narrow. These were added later. Um, but even then, you still get these deities, you get the niches, which would have been a very early, you know, precursor of an actual subterranean temple. And now just a word about what you do see now, and I'll go back into this more at the end, but our oldest building in the United States, which I think is in Santa Fe, it's a mud house from I think about 1600. And you can't touch it. If you put a finger on it, you know, you, the park rangers like wrestle you to the ground and drag you off. Now, here is one of the oldest step wells in India. They couldn't tell me where it was in this town. And it's filled with garbage and nobody goes there. It's just, it's a very different attitude. And I can talk about that later. But this kind of thing makes me cry. But it is what it is. This gives you an idea, you know, <laughs> I want to say something that I was so terrified of this because I know that at the end, and you can't even see it very well, but at the end of that, there's a sheer drop off. I didn't know how deep it was going to be. It took me a while to even find that shaft that I just showed you going through the underbrush. And I am just terrified of falling into these things. I still am, and yet I had to go down. So there was so much garbage that I had to like kick this 500 years of trash more away and slide down on my booty until I got to the, the bottom and I thought, well, okay, that's six feet, I could handle that. It's been totally silted up and you can see how this shaft had to be like hewn out of solid rock. And you can see what, you know, 600 years of garbage looks like. Now, within just a few centuries of that, you could see structures like this, which, um, again, this has become somewhat better known since I first saw it 10 years ago when there was nobody there. The uh, Archaeological Survey of India has taken over this. This is on the road, 15 minutes off the road, between Jaipur and Agra. Millions of tourists pass this every year, millions. And yet, 
it's not on tourist itineraries. It's, uh, how many of you have been to India? Raise your hands here. How many of you have seen this? Don't you want to shoot yourself now? <laughs> I love that. It's like 15 minutes off the road. It is one of the largest, deepest, oldest step wells in India. I defy you to find another building as fascinating as this. It's the most compelling structure and it's got one of the most interesting histories because the original building um, was, uh, was constructed in roughly 800 AD by the local, um, the local Maharaja, King Chand, which means uh, moon. And even now, at the bottom of this, you can see these deity statues, which would have, you know, all this would have been submerged. Even this could have been submerged. Um, and 600 years later, um, wait, I'm not doing that right. A thousand years later, flunk math. Um, when after the Islamic incursion into India, uh, Muslims came along, a Muslim ruler, and decided to slam an additional sort of Islamic palace, a place that they could go and cool off. This would not have been for the public. And you can tell the difference in those styles, and I'll talk about this a little later too, because this kind of flat roof and, and these kind of short columns, uh, this kind of stocky, it's almost like Frank Lloyd Wright prairie style. This was typical of Hindu structures. Uh, they didn't have the true arch. They couldn't have created this kind of arch uh, until, um, until Muslims came to India. That they, they provided that. But seeing these two styles slammed together across a thousand years in two different faiths, very, very unusual. Okay, so that's the development of stepwell history. And after 800, you know, they had proliferated throughout India. I've seen them in um, eight states. Um, I could go and see them in probably at least 10 more. You do not find them in South India because you find temple tanks and certain types of water structures, but there's more water in the South, so you don't need to actually create these. But they proliferated, and again, we don't know, but the number 3,000 has been bandied about as how many there were by the end of their heyday, so let's say by the 18th century, um, when really the decline began. I don't know, you can find these in every single village. Every village, every city had to have them. Numerous ones, and as we saw in Delhi, there could have been 100 by the time all eight cities of Delhi had been built. So, I mean, your guess is as good as mine, um, which is true in almost everything. They were built in forts. Every fort needed at least one stepwell to provide for sieges that, in the case of the one on the left, like 200 years that place was under siege over you know, different, um, different regimes. Very, very different types of constructions in the fort. They were built in large cities, Hyderabad, and uh, oh, the one on the left is in uh, Narno, Haryana, another state. They were built not just in, um, you know, outside for uh, travelers and caravans, but just in rural village communities. Um, if somebody decided to commission a stepwell, which is the case on the one on the left. We know a little bit about that. But these are just, they seem like you're in the middle of nowhere, but there are villages around them that would have come and taken advantage of them. And then there are the wells that were really out in the middle of nowhere. Um, like the one on the left and the one on the right, which I drove by probably five times because you could not see it. One of the hallmarks, of, I mean this, this wall is like three feet high. It wasn't even as tall as the one um, in the first in, uh, in Rudabai. You just, they have no presence, no above ground presence. And in fact, um, here's another one which is in Delhi. I mean, part of the allure and part of the reason why nobody knows her around is because a lot of times you just cannot see At the Red Fort in Delhi, which everybody goes to, and I'm, how many people have been to the Red Fort? How many people have seen this? <laughs> Whoever that is, wow, it's amazing you even knew about it. Because like the guards there don't know where to find this thing. 
Um, again, this is one that uh, there's not really any, they, everybody speculates about who built it, about when it was built, but if you are not looking for it and you decide, oh, there's an interesting bird, you would fall right into this thing. It's not that deep, but it's deep enough to kill you. And um, it's a very interesting well. I mean, it, technically it's L-shaped, but it's a perfect square. So um, it's like a mirror image when you see it. And it has a very interesting history. Oh, thank you. Um, I don't have a very good picture of this. You know, when I first started taking pictures of these step wells, by the way, um, it was just because I was interested. I never in a billion years would have thought I would get a book and an exhibition out of it. I am not a photographer. Every single one of these, and I've seen 200 step wells now at least, all around India, was with a tiny, cheap, point and shoot, idiot proof camera that I got at, um, at Best Buy and never even read the, all I knew is that if I set it on automatic, I could take a picture, and if I still do that, I don't know anything about it. It's embarrassing, kind of, but now I'm pr proud of it because I get photographers calling me all the time and saying, you know, what lens and what <laughs> FTP and how did you frame that? It's like, I'm sorry, but I sat down and I took it out and I clicked. And if it ever goes off the automatic setting, I freak out because I, I'm not even sure how to get it back. Really, I'm serious. And I bring that camera sometimes. It just goes to show you that like anybody can be a photographer, but I would have taken more pictures of some of the earlier ones. Um, there's no real excuse though, because this is in Delhi. I have to go back there. It's hard to get into. A lot of these are locked up. I have crawled under fences, over fences. I bribed people. You'll see one of these people in a minute. And this is hard to get into. It's locked and there's really no sign. There's one sign. But it steps away from everybody taking Instagram selfies, you know, of themselves in the Red Fort. Um, this was pretty much abandoned for centuries. And then uh, the British used it as a prison for freedom fighters before partition. So you can actually see in some of these arches on the side where they brick them in and there's actually still bars. And there were a number of freedom fighters who were um, kept there after, then, uh, after partition, after the British left. It was taken over by the army and they decided it had a great use as a latrine. So it was a you know, centuries old toilet for a long time until the Archaeological Survey of India took it over and semi-cleaned it up. They can help or they can hinder. There's, anyway, I won't go into that. Another one in Delhi that people really often don't know about, although it's, it's changing now for a funny reason. This is right, it like steps from the most congested shopping area in the center of New Delhi, which is uh, Connaught Place. And like you walk three blocks, you go down this little lane, it's very quiet, there's houses there, you see this wall, and if you walk in there, I know, and it's not even like a spectacular step well. It's just, I mean, it's, it's, it's four stories, that's kind of piddly in step well parlance, but it's, it's an extraordinary experience because it's so unexpected, and you can't really see, but here in the background are all these contemporary buildings. Now, Agrasen, um, would have been on the outskirts of Delhi at the time that it was built, because Delhi, the, real, the Delhi then was like miles away. So this would have definitely been for travelers going to or from the city. And you can see exactly what I was talking about with these niches, it's um, very cool when you go in there. Uh, one thing I want to mention here is that you notice that the construction of this is rubble. Delhi is a very rocky um, soil there and there's and you can use stone in the building most of the ancient structures were built of stone and they didn't need any of the bridging support elements that you'll see in Gujarat where it's oh you know what thank you I've got a bottle here oh well, maybe let me just use that Say, oh okay here you take this and I'll take that thank you so much I appreciate you man I bet this is like the chattiest lecture you've ever heard, where somebody's like, I promise not to take anything else off. 
I feel much better. And I haven't had to, God, I just hate myself right now. Um, so this kind of rocky construction is very different from the ones that we see uh, down in, in Gujarat, where it's a very loamy, clay, soft, um, geological, um, what the ground is made of, it's inarticulate. Uh, and so you needed a lot of support, a lot of buttressing. And that could also define what the style of the step well is. Anyway, now, I used to go to this step well, you know, 10 years ago, empty, nobody there. But because a hugely popular movie came out, I think in 2015, um, starring Amir Khan, one of the biggest Bollywood stars of all time, he plays an alien, it's a really stupid movie, but um, he plays an alien who lives in this step well. <laughs> and now when you go, it is just filled, it's, kind of, it's great because you want to activate these places. And they're always like these young couples canoodling in those little, because there's nowhere to go and make out. And if you're a young couple in Delhi, you see these couples in the parks and you know everybody lives with their four generations. So it's not like now you can go and visit somebody in their home. Anyway. It's, uh, this is an even a busy day. I mean, now there would be kids all over those steps. Um, I want to just show you another dramatic example of a step with that you would never know it's there. And the idea that this is not in any history book. History of Indian architecture, it is nowhere. You can see this really clearly from um, Oh, what's it called from uh, Google Earth? Because I had to spend the hardest part of my book, besides coming up with dates, was trying to put in the GPS coordinates, which I never had. So I would spend days driving around in circles looking for somebody like Kimabai to show me where he step well was. So I decided I'm going to put GPS coordinates in. I didn't have those. This is going to make it much easier, unless you really like the hunt and then just don't even bother. But. Um, this one is easy to find from the air, from a satellite. I spent hours and hours and hours trying to find these because they're impossible to see. And in two cases, I had to commission somebody in Gujarat, two different people, to find these two steples and give me the coordinates. It was that difficult. So this one is 10 minutes off the road between Delhi and Jaipur in a lovely little town called Nimrana, which had the first fort hotel up on a hill. You can stay there, you can have lunch. It's absolutely delightful looking over the huge plain from the Aravali Hills. And this was actually in their brochure. I knew it was there, I wanted to find it. This is like 10 years ago. Um, and I, I showed them in the brochure. It's like, where, where is the stuff? And I'm like, well, we don't know. What is that? I'm like, well, it's in your brochure. Anyway, that didn't work. It's down this, it's down this little tiny road that you have to really search for in the town. You go down this road, you see a wall, you walk towards it. And it's just, it is mammoth. This, it's just enormous and it's decrepit and an incredible structure. And in fact, you can see, this is one that I can now bring myself to very carefully walk down, mainly because I was always going down on my behind because you can see it's incredibly steep, incredibly decrepit, and I was always, you know, terrified of falling. And then one day I turned around on one of these visits and there these two like bulky Indian ladies who were a lot older than me, just like going down in their saris, like boop, 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 boop. I thought, and I'm here on my butt? I don't think so. I'm not going to let these ladies show me up. So I now walk down. But it's, um, this is where I actually became obsessed. I mean, I was interested in the step wells before that. But standing here and looking through there, it's just the most unusual view. It's just a, a shocking. You can't really tell what you're looking at because of those layers. This is when you're at the bottom, and when you're looking up, don't forget that up there is ground level. It's nine stories when you count the um, understories. It was thought to have been, but this is just a rumor, that it was a uh, famine relief project that the, the Takor, the local landowner, um, 
commissioned so that his people actually had some money because all their crops had died. Who knows? We don't even have his name. Uh, but this is one that has three different dates associated with it. I think that I chose, what was it, 1570? Yeah, but it, there's older, there's more recent in the 18th century. I don't know. I just like the older thing. Okay, so the last couple ones that we've looked at are Islamic wells, and you can always tell those because there's like no decoration almost ever once they get beyond a certain uh, date, and because they also use arches in a kind of a style that didn't exist before, uh, before Islam came to India. But when you go to Gujarat, there's still a preponderance of Hindu wells there. And again, the oldest wells that we've seen. But so many of the other wells were destroyed um, in northern parts of India, and in, in lots of parts. But um, when Ahmedabad uh, was settled, was founded in 1411, uh, and really the whole uh, Muslim army was pouring in, Steppas were a form of architecture that was unknown in the Islamic world, and yet they had such a rich, vibrant history of water structures. We want, you know, think of the Alhambra um, with those water courses and fountains, but never a step well. And so they were absolutely smitten by this form and issued edicts not to harm them in Gujarat. That was not the case up in uh, the north, in Delhi, in those areas. But down in the south, we still get some extraordinary step wells. Rani Kibau, which, and I think I have it on that list, that there could be many, many different names for step wells. But in Gujarat, it looks like Vav. It's pronounced Bao um, in Hindi. Or in the north, in other areas, Bauri, Bauri. There's just like so many names. And you can go into a village and say, Bauli, yeah, huh? Is there a step well here? And they go, nee, no Bauli. Uh, Bauri? Oh, yeah, there's a Bauri over there, but what's a Bauli? You know, it's just it, this bizarre inflection in my Hindi is really bad. Uh, Rani Kibau is another one of these, I mean, shockers. Why am I even saying this? You're going to get bored. You go to a wall, it doesn't look like anything. But then when you approach it, you're thinking, well, wow, the ground drops away kind of fast. And you're looking at this, and really that's the full scale of it. Yeah, it's, this is, there's a better known history of this step well than almost all of them. Um, and it became a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2014. Uh, the only step well in India that's been designated that and is about to appear on a dollar, on the 100 rupee note, which is like our dollar bill. So it's probably the most famous in a way, but that doesn't mean people have heard of it or go there. It's about an hour outside of Ahmedabad. Um, there's a huge number of step wells around there. But it, it's a really interesting story about this step well because, and here's the axiometric view. You can see it's six stories deep, but it's just, it was the most grandiose, expensive, lavish step well ever built, like anything since. And it's from roughly 1062. And you know, if you look up European architecture from that period, I defy you to find anything as extraordinary as this. And you're going to see even more. The, the forces of, of uh, digging down into the earth to create a structure versus uh, digging up in the forces of gravity versus the stresses of digging in the earth, it's much, much more difficult. I've talked to many different engineers about this, and one guy was like, no, they can't have done that. That's crazy. It's like, I'm sorry, I can sh take you there. Um, but there's a huge amount of buttressing, um, and you can see those, those huge uh, bridges that go across. This was commissioned by Queen Udayamati, whose husband, Bindev, um, was murdered, uh, killed during war. It was in the, Sol the Solanki period. And they were like the Medici of India. They were just architecture obsessed. They commissioned extraordinary buildings everywhere. And this is one of them. But when this was completed, and the, the scholar on this, he's on your list, is um, 
Kirat Mankodi, um, his book, The Queen's Step, well, is, I think, out of print, but you can sometimes find it in India. He says, you know, it took 25 years to build. But sometime soon after it was completed, hopefully Udayamati wasn't around to see this, but there's always a source of water nearby that has some, you can tell that there's uh, some kind of water catchment and you know that there's water available in that region or you have to dig down 13 stories. There's a river that was the source of this close by and it changed course and knocked through the well and flooded the entire thing and filled up with silt. So that was how it remained for a thousand years almost and um, it, there were just these columns, I think, do I have a p picture of this? There are these columns, stumpy columns, that were still sticking up at, at the ground level. And so nobody could really tell what was under there until it was kind of stumbled upon by the British in the 19th century. Who, all they could really see were, and, and this was after it was excavated, but there was just a little bit of the uh, wellhead that was projecting above ground. It wasn't until the 1980s that the archaeological survey decided to start excavating it. And at the time, because it had been silted up and left like that for centuries, it was like Pompeii. Everything had been preserved um, over time. That never would have happened if it had not been filled up to the brim. And what they did discover was this. Uh, there are over 600 sculptures in here. I want you to just pay attention to those columns. Though. You can see that a lot, of, uh, a lot of them are missing. These would have been much taller than that. The, the, the sculptural decor of this thing, it's just, it's hard to even like, get your head around it. It's all scenes from the Ramayana. Um, every column is different. The carving on them, you know, this kind of business where you carve through, that takes a huge amount of skill. So Ronnie filled up and it had columns sticking up and other sculpture. And all the stone that we saw in that was carted there from 140 kilometers away uh, because there's no stone in Patan. So like almost every culture in the world, this stuff is open to cannibalism. And when there's no stone around and you are lazy and you want to build something, you just go and take it from somebody else. And the entire town of Patton, if you look around, you can see bits and pieces of Rani Kibau, like embedded in these houses and what have you. But the guy who really made something extraordinary out of pilfering uh, from Rani Kibau was a fellow by the name of Bahadur Singh who apparently owned the property that Rani was on. This is about five kilometers away. It was a very late step well by 1800. There weren't that many being built because you could just get a village tap. You could get a hose. There was plumbing. But Bahadur decided to build one of these um, to water his, uh, his land. And it's a small step well. It's embedded between buildings. It's hard to find. Most people never see it. And when you go into it, and it's a wonderful experience because you can't experience Rani the way it would have been experienced, which would have been like Rudabai, or like this, where you get that transition going into the earth and all of those different activated senses and the contrast. You can't get that at Rani because it's disappeared, not, you know. But when you go to Bahadur Singh, you're actually getting the Rani experience surrounded by the things that he stole, columns and niches and whatever. In this 19th century shell, it's kind of like going to Epcot Center. You know, you're getting, oh, this feels like Paris, but it's on a much smaller level. And I don't think this is real. But anyway, it's. If you look closely at these, he just took whatever columns he could easily get. But that means that they were all different sizes. And he, sometimes they just didn't fit. And in fact, this one, I don't even know what this was. Um, maybe from somewhere else, because it's not actually uh, carved. But in 
most of the columns, you can see where he created plinth and just, I'm trying to find like right in there, to make them the right height. He's just like, okay, well, this isn't fitting. Let's just carve another thing and lift it up. Uh, but they're very clearly from Ronnie, and there's inside these niches, you can also see sculpture that he took. It's an interesting experience, very beautiful little step, well, tiny, but beautiful. In, in between Ronnie and, and 1800, oh, it's time for a break. I'll tell you what happened. <laughs> when Amdabad was founded in 1411, and uh, there was, you know, this huge kind of movement of uh, up through India, while uh, the Muslims basically became the predominant. Uh, they were they they won the war. Let's put it that way, and uh, it was essentially a Muslim country for a very long time. The Hindus were the secondary population, even though there were plenty of Hindus around. But um, there was a moment when. The Hindus and Muslim architecture kind of merged and made this what I like to call Islamadu style. It's <laughs> because as I was saying, there was no knowledge of step wells in the Islamic world. But there were, uh, so, so the Hindus gave to Islam the idea of a step well and certain stylistic um, elements that were incorporated going forward. But uh, Islam gave to Hinduism, uh, to Hindu architects, the true arch and the true dome. Up to that point, everything was trabia, it was post and lintel flat. If you wanted to make a dome, it was very flattened. It was corbel that was just, you know, stones put around each other. They didn't have these systems. So arches and domes didn't exist. And for this brief, beautiful period, of just a very short time, 10, 20 years, it's hard to say, um, in and around Ahmedabad, you get a melding, a transporter malfunction of styles. We saw some of that already at uh, Rudabai, which was also from right around 1500, uh, with the kind of decoration, with uh, the octagonal um, entryway, and so we can see a lot of these specific uh, flourishes at a step well very close by, right in, uh, right in Ahmedabad, called Dada Harir. The entryway is a pillar of eight columns with that Islamic dome. And you can tell it's not flattened. And this chhatri, which is also kind of a, uh, you can see the Islamic, well, I should be pointing this. This is a chhatri that's overlooking this um, eight side, this octagonal shaft. The octagon was something that was used frequently. It was an important um, component of Islamic architecture. There was still a lot of decoration in these, a lot of ornament. Um, so if you walked in, you might think that it was a Hindu well because it, they were utilizing uh, Hindu craftsmen these casts that had been doing this type of carving, creating these kind of, of structures for centuries. Another thing that you can't really see here, but was an idea that was um, also Islamic, was that behind each of these um, flat areas is a bench. So you can actually go and sit and look over into an octagonal pool at the bottom. You get an octagonal pool followed by this. And that's where um, the overflow water would come. Uh, people would uh, bathe there. They would bring water up those steps on their heads. Women sometimes twice a day in jugs. You still see that, by the way, um, in the ones that are still functioning with water in them. And I'll talk about that more. But this, when you see something like this, you know that it has an Islamic uh, background. Also, this type of a stairway, this um, circular stairway, all of those were Islamic incursions into an Islam, into a Hindu idea. But another thing that was really interesting, I was pointing out these niches where you still see um, all kinds of uh, prayers and ritualistic um, 
thing left over detritus, if you can call it that, uh, so that something on the right, this you know, consort and deity, this was something that in every Hindu step well, every Hindu temple, you would have recognized. But of course, you're not allowed to put these Hindu deities into an Islamic well. So they substituted sort of symbolic um, uh, designs that would have been recognized. They were, they were in the Islamic tradition, but also reflected in the Hindu tradition. So you see this tree of life, um, which could have been interpreted, too, as a symbol of uh, a religious symbol, or in this case, uh, a lotus flower. And even now, this is the guy on the right, that's in uh, Rudabai Stepwell, which I first showed you. He's not, there's not an image of a deity in there. It is an image of a flower or actually a tree of life, I can't recall. I have to go back and get a better picture. Um, but that moment where you could still even get all of these, um, these, these floral motifs, sometimes you even see animal motifs, Within a few years, that disappeared. You're really, um, it's forbidden in Islam to have this kind of uh, decoration and anything figurative. You can still sometimes get floral decoration in Islamic buildings, but no figuration at all. So there are sometimes courses of elephants or birds that you would see around this period, but they disappeared shortly thereafter. The other thing that came with um, Islam to India was an entirely different type of stepwell. Uh, up to that point, stepwells had been very public. Um, they may not have been for the general public, like the one that we saw, uh, well, actually, the first version of it. Um, sometimes they were attached to temples, and so the people, the, the uh, parishioners of that temple would have used that particular well. Certain communities used their specific well. They were um, externalized. You could see them. You could see into them. You knew a well was there once you were familiar with its placement. And within the context of your community, everybody could use them except for, the, of course, the untouchable class. But with Islam came a new tradition of what is sometimes referred to as a retreat well. These were the opposite of um, an externalized structure. They were all internal. They were specifically private. They were built either in forts by uh, the ruler or they were in uh, pleasure gardens for uh, rich people. But you could not tell from the outside what was going on. And remember, again, these are subterranean structures. So while well, this is outside of Ahmedabad uh, a while, like two hours, and when you go, this is what you see. It's like a bunker. And there's nothing. It's, it's actually really unattractive. It just is like this platform. Um, and you can't go in it anymore, apparently. But you just go down these stairs, and then these are really hard to take pictures of. It's just this long central shaft of a well, and there's apparatus on the top. This would have been for a, a bucket that interestingly, apparently, um, even though uh, these stairs go down to where the water might have been, the women were not allowed. They were all in Purda. These were very private. Nobody was allowed to see them. And they were all sequestered in these rooms that, were, that had no light in them. They were not walking around this inner shaft. It's interesting, the day I was there, there was this just lovely family that happened to be there, which is so rare, I cannot tell you. It was wonderful. And they're always so excited to see me, you know, at these wonderful structures of there. And plus, it just, it's nice to see some color and something lively going on, because they always think I'm insane, but, you know, whatever. Now, I'm pretty intrepid, or have been. I'm not sure that I would be now. It's the first year I haven't gone back to India in decades to go on another stepwell hunt, to get my, you know, I love being in India. But I didn't go because of this move. And um, now, in retrospect, since I've had a little bit of time not to think about it, I can't believe I was going into some of these things alone, in the middle of nowhere, with a Hindi-speaking driver. What was I thinking? So now I'd be scared, maybe. I don't know. When I go and I see one, it's like something comes over me. It's like, I got to go in. I got to go in. 
Um, I've only broken my foot once. Like not, nothing really bad has happened, but there's always a first time. So this is one of the only places I would not go in because you can see that these were places that, um, this was another Islamic feature, were these niches in the wall to actually put oil lamp so you could see because it would be very very dark and this was the daytime and you still can't see in that room where the screeching of thousands of bats <laughs> coming out of that room I was kind of like no I don't there's nobody here who is going to make me go in or know that I didn't go in except no I'm telling you but that forget it there's bats in all of these places but they're little bats at the top there's not a room full of screeching Carl's bad bats that are gonna come out like <laughs> if I go in there with my camera um, anyway here's another one of these retreat private wells and this is on the grounds of the uh, Red Fort in Agra and I can tell you that once again the head of the local archaeological survey of India for Agra um, and the guy who was in charge of this fort had never been in this thing and had a hard time finding it. But it's right there. Because when you look at it, it it's like, oh, there's a subway grate. You know, it's, you cannot understand the complexity of this thing. It's hard to take a picture of it. It goes down seven stories. I had to use my flash for this. And I, I can't really show you what it is. So let me show you this. It's probably the most complex, astonishing structure other than the Rani Kibau. But, you know, this one is a lot later. And I did go into all of these chambers. There are two story chambers in there that were all painted. And the water is all the way down here. Um, sometimes these are called spiral wells because the um, staircase is spiral down to the bottom. Then there's a separate straight stairway, which I can't even show. It's kind of down here. That just goes straight up here, which they think may have been for Akbar himself to go down there. Nobody really knows. But it's an extraordinary structure, the likes of which I've never even heard a hint of. OK. So, and this is an hour, is this an hour and a half so far? That's good, because I'm nearing sort of the end. Um, the why, why, why of Stepwells is what has sort of, what captivated me along with just these structures, because nobody knows about them. How is it possible that we know about other less impressive structures in India? There's a billion temples. People go and see the tombs, the temples, the forts, all of these marvelous things. I'm not dissing them. But how can we not know about this entire typology that went on for well over a millennium? that has no comparison anywhere. They were unique to the subcontinent, predominantly India. You do find them in Pakistan. Yes, there are other structures that have water and steps, but there's nothing that functioned like this for such a specific reason. How are they unknown? Even within India, even with people who lived on the street of Agra Sen Kibali in Delhi, this Indian guy came up to me. He's like, I'm embarrassed to say that I went to school and lived a block away, and I had no idea it was on the other side of that wall. It's like, you should be embarrassed. Don't tell me that. People shouldn't even reveal that. Just like, go and see it now. But there are a lot of reasons. I can just tell you that within India, I mean, the idea that you can't find them, that when you do find them, sometimes I get there and like they've just been blasted and covered over for a parking lot or a house is built over it. Or most of the time it's just that they're filled with trash or filthy. Um, there's no respect for these structures. They're abandoned, 99% of them. I've shown you some that are visited, that are cared for by the government or the locals. Um, 
But that is really a relative handful. Out of the 200 I've seen, most of them are in a deplorable uh, state and are vanishing. But here's what happened. First of all, uh, they're costly to build. And starting in the 18th century, the Mughal Empire, which was the in power, began to splinter at the same time that the, there was the rise of the British Raj. Uh, so there were no longer communities or rulers that had the kind of money that was required. Uh, Suddenly, the power structure shifted to Great Britain. And when the British came there, they're not 100% responsible for all of what happened. They were already on the decline, these structures. Um, but this, these structures where communities congregated, along with animals, were washing, drinking, uh, doing your clothes, dive doing your, your religious ablutions, lighting candles, all of that happening in one place, out in the open, we all know that that is not something that was gonna fly with the Brits. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't see that as the most hygienic situation. And the British were specifically opposed and banned many of these and filled a number of them in, we'll never know how many. Um, now, Indians, of course, the British, let me start, I'm not being articulate about this for some reason, but um, the British did not understand the social component of the stepwells. They just saw the physical, uh, the need of these to supply water. But of course, now we know that there were a huge number of other reasons that were important. They were social centers. They were the structures around which a community would congregate. So. When the British came along with bringing things like village taps, like pumps, like central cisterns, and you had a choice between walking down 100 steps every day or having to pull up you know, a, uh, a bucket or you just turn on a spigot, of course, it's obvious. Progress is where people go. Uh, and once these structures were cut off from their main purpose of bringing water to the community, there really weren't strong reasons to upkeep them. People did keep them clean when they were being used, maybe not clean in the way that we think we wouldn't be drinking that water, but, but then they were, they were clean. It was well water, it was groundwater. You could use that water. It's what people used. Um, but there was no reason to continue doing that uh, unless some place was specifically associated with a deity and then they would have still gone there to worship. I'm trying to figure out what order to talk about this. And this is just one that, you know, I discovered not long ago outside of, uh, not far from Jaipur actually, it's really, it's, I, I couldn't even get in this one. It's so um, overgrown. It's like kind of just seeing Tikal or someplace through, or Angkor Wat, like bushwhacking. What began to happen, and I'll talk about the uses, because some of these are still in use in various ways. But what happened um, is that when communities no longer respected and no longer needed them, Cities began to be built up around them without caring that they were in the way. And so you get these structures completely embedded in the urban, um, in urban centers. This is one of the ones that I needed to um, actually send somebody to find. Excuse me. Oh, don't you hate that when you're going to sneeze and then it goes away? Good. I didn't want to sneeze into my microphone. Uh, this is an extraordinary step well in a town that was actually um, ruled by one of the Solankis, one of the last of the Solankis who loved building all these great projects. Now, this was a, a local utilitarian step well. It's not a lavish step well. It would have been used just by a community. Um, and now, this is considered a protected monument. 
you can get protected monuments in India. In India. Some are protected by um, ASI, which is the national organization. Some are protected by the local government. But in either case, it doesn't mean diddly squat, because this is protected. And this is how it looks. Uh, this one is just, I can't even understand what was happening here, but this, there were three entrances here. The most common uh, number of entrances for stepples is a single one, but you can also get three entrances. Uh, you can get two entrances if it's L-shaped, or you can get four in some cases. This was a, this had three entrances, but you can't, you can barely see them because the houses were not just built on top of it, but they actually, you know, cannibalized a lot of the stone. It's very, very steep, and you really, I don't have no, how many levels it is. It does have water in it, which is surprising um, because it's in Gujarat. But it's, it's an extraordinary and very uh, beautiful well. But you can see on the side there where, you know, they, oops, they literally just plonked the brick on top of these incredible massive uh, stones that you see in, in Gujarat, which had no um, mortar between them. They're beautifully, perfectly fit. There's another protected monument, a uh, 13th century monument in a little wonderful walled village. And like many stepwells in India, just a side note, there are, there are frequently wonderful myths associated with them. And they fall into three different categories. One is that the well also, one is that it's connected to the Ganges River, like thousands of kilometers away. Another one is that there is a secret tunnel to the fort of whomever is, was running the joint. I don't know where. That, a third, actually, is that the well had one dry, so you needed to have a double suicide in order to get the water back, which is the case here. And a fourth, actually, is that a ghost came and destroyed the well and then a deity came and put it back together. We'll see one of those. But in any case, this one had a double suicide uh, associated with it. There's actually a song about it, that they built the well, there was no water, and the local witch said, you need um, uh, a married couple in, to, to kill themselves here, and then the water will come back. And so the head of the village, his uh, son, and brief daughter-in-law got married and went to the well in their wedding finery, and with every step they took, the water rose another level until they died, and now there's actually water in this thing. And it's still, uh, there's a very important shrine there. It's an extraordinary well. This, you can't even see it that clearly, but this is this beautifully carved, very unusual, it looks like a patchwork quilt, with no two of those stone panels the same. But you can see what it means to be um, protected. I mean, these 13th century carvings that are just unbelievable. You know, we would go and see those at your museum and people would just be astonished by um, the beauty of them if they weren't falling apart. But this is also interesting because you can see how embedded in the community it is now. Uh, it has this very unusual style of this pagoda style roof. You get a, I've only seen like three of those in that particular area. But like many of these wells, they're so embedded that I have to find unusual ways of getting to see them. In this case, it was knocking on the door of this house, which was built right there. And like, imagine doing that here, excuse me, I can't get a good view of the play lot. Can I come in? You know, it'd be like 911, there's a crazy person here. And, and these people did think I was crazy, but they were also flattered. They all wanted me to stay to dinner. You know, it's a lovely couple. I crawled out onto their roof to just get an idea of how <laughs> that was situated. And another one of these, which is, um, 12th century. This one is amazing because it's got like 135 of these little niches that would have each had a deity in it. Um, the story associated with this is that the local Solanke ruler, um, his mom, 
had some skin ailment and there was a spring here and she went in it and it cured her skin. Yeah, I could go there right now. <laughs> Darn it. That's what we need instead of the spa. Anyway, he built this beautiful um, step well, a kund, and there's a water hauling apparatus also. But uh, this is how it looks today. You, it's really hard to find. It's very hard to access, and you can't get a good view of it until I knocked on one of these roofs, and there was a guy wouldn't let me take his picture, but I had to lean out that window to get that particular view to see what the whole thing actually looked like from above. One of the most difficult ones, but funniest ones to find, was I'd heard in Jodhpur, there's a zoo there, that there were several step wells in the zoo. Gosh, I didn't show the other one. There's, I have so many of these, I, I could go on for hours, but why drive you crazy? Um, so I went to the zoo and we were like talking to the head zookeeper and, you know, I said, there's a step well here, yeah? Yes, he knew of it. Um, I tried, he wouldn't take me in to see it. I mean, I paid money to get in the zoo, but he wouldn't take me to see it. He wouldn't take a bribe, which is astonishing. Like that's the only government employee in India that wouldn't <laughs> take a bribe, <laughs> including Modi. I mean, like from the bottom up, he said I had to go and get permission from the head of whatever the park was, who was close by, and luckily the guy was there. That was another miracle, because 90% of the time, if you go into any government office, there's nobody in it. Uh, and it was open, the guy was there. I'd say, I want to go see the step well in your zoo. And again, it's sort of like, here, it's this crazy, blonde, middle-aged woman from who knows where asking to see the step well, like, what's going on? So I went back, this guy was not happy about it. He takes me first into that, you know, walking all around. It's actually a pretty well-kept zoo, but it's, you wouldn't want to be an animal in an Indian zoo for sure. Unlocks this door. Then we walk through the goose enclosure. <laughs> you know, moving these things out of the way. I'm like, where is this thing? I hope it's not the lion enclosure. And, <laughs> And there it is, this gorgeous thing that nobody will ever see, but they are pumping water out of it, um, you know, for the geese, I guess, and whoever else is around. Uh, another protected well, and this is the other thing that can happen. Well, we already saw how you can build on these wells, you can cannibalize them. There's literally nobody who is paying any attention. And this is a great case in point. This 13th century, astonishingly cool well, um, where you know, government has taken the time to put up this sign, and they always say, do not deface, you know, no spit, no litter. But it's perfectly OK to build something right on top of it. <laughs> and this is like some kind of a garden center or something. And they just like, OK, well, this is a nice place to, you know, build our office, it's just, I, anyway, I go back and I see the step wells periodically, um, and even when they're in bad shape to start with, they're in worse shape now, most of them. Every now and then that's not the case. Um, three years apart, this is a very late step well uh, in the city of Narnal. It's kind of, yeah, it's overgrown on the left, but it's jaunty, it's pretty, that green kind of duckweed, it's not moss, it actually protects the surface of the water. Um, wouldn't be growing if the water was super toxic. And now it's just malevolent looking. You know, you can't even get down into it. It's whoever was like sweeping it and taking, it's just now forget it. In another three years, it'll be filled in. Another one close by, which is, you know, a, a really beautiful well out in the countryside. And you can see how it's being taken over. Um, by the way, this is one that I want to show you what can happen when I go and look at a step well. Like, I go into these places and there's literally nobody around, which is great. And so I start going into the well, and before I know it, it's like some kind of, you know, drum system, like foreigner in the well, foreigner in the well. And then, like, all of a sudden, like, the entire village is there. <laughs> like, everybody, it's like, Drop everything, you know? And it can be really difficult. And this was a case in point where I could not, you see the well in the background,
people start coming into the well and like walking around trying to figure out, did she drop something? Like, why is she here? What's she looking at? And I can't, I don't, it's fine, I like pictures of people in the well, but I don't want people like standing there in front of me like, what are you looking for? <laughs> and in this case, I literally had to promise that I would take pictures of everybody afterwards, but I was so mobbed that I had to go into this enclosure because I, I literally, I was mobbed by people. And they're, everybody's really nice. I have never been threatened. It, it, it's just there, they just cannot understand why somebody is there uh, looking at this thing that they could not care less about. Uh, one person in this group said to me, Will you make our village famous? We are very poor. And I said, I, actually, I hope I do, because I do believe that that's the only way that these will be preserved, is if people start going there, and then they can sell water to the locals, and the locals are going to say, we better take care of this, because we want more tourists here. This was one of the most just like heart-breaking things I ever saw. This is in... Um, I didn't put the, sorry, I, was, I don't always put the titles up. Um, this is in a tiny little town, uh, Fatipur Sikri, a different, fa Fatipur, not Fatipur Sikri, in uh, Rajasthan. And I, you know, I read whatever I can find, like footnotes and articles from graduate students. Like you can spend time and you get information. Um, you see something on an old map and I knew that there was a step well there and I just kept, Nobody knew where this thing was. And so I just started walking around and this just looked like a gateway to something and I looked through a hole and I saw, I was actually over there, I looked through and I saw all of this garbage. And I went around and got on top of a roof in the local library where the guy had to literally take the door off to give me access to the roof. Like who would do that here? And then I could get the size of this massive scale of what was probably 16th century, judging by it, and filled with garbage. I want to say something about that. I used to just be horrified by this. But honestly, in a, in a country where there is virtually no garbage pickup at all. In the years that I've gone there, there's like seen two garbage trucks and there's nobody. How would you possibly deal with the garbage in India? I, I, it's just, a, there's 1.3 billion people there who are not used to ever putting something in a bin and there are no bins. So a giant pit like that, if you have a choice between putting it on the street or in a pit that you have no use for, you have no idea what it is, it's falling apart. Putting it in the pit makes a lot of sense. And there's also no reason to try and conserve this step well in 90% of the step wells I've seen because they're in the middle of nowhere and nobody's gonna see them. So if you have X amount of dollars to put into um, conserving something, to dusting it, to, to, to keep it going, and you have a choice between a temple in Delhi or a, a steple in Dank, Gujarat, where it's not even on a map, where the, the villagers aren't gonna keep it up. Why would you? It's a sad, sad fact, but they have too many things to preserve in India. It's not like us where we have one stupid adobe house from 1600, and we're like, you know, let's put all our money into that. Uh, it, it, there's natural disasters, like this was an extraordinary, one of the wells that's out in the hinterlands um, of Gujarat where there was a devastating earthquake in 2001, killed 20,000 people. Why would anybody restore this? Now, as far as um, water, I mean, you do get water in places, but when they're in step wells that people don't care about, and I say they've been silted up over the centuries, I just found this by accident. This is what it looks like when they're silted up. Like, you would have to take out a lot of sand in order to even understand what this step well looks like. I have no idea how deep it could be. It could be, you know, four stories deep. It could be fabulous. We'll never know. But in most cases, there is no water in India. There are already riots breaking out. They have to truck water into rural communities. 
the water table has dropped so precipitously that, for instance, in Delhi, um, on the right, this is a photograph by Raju Rai from the, from the 1970s. This was before the Stepo was restored. And water at the time, the water table, was 26 feet below the surface. It was very easy to access. Rocky water table did exactly what it was supposed to do, rise and fall. You can see where the level is. It's now 200 feet down because of all the illegal bore wells, and they cannot control it. And in Gujarat, most of the wells are just dry, like there's no way to reconnect them with their water source, which they're trying to do, and sometimes successfully, in areas. But in order to do that, the water table has to be available. Now, the other thing is that there are step wells that are still being used for irrigation. Um, a number of them that are still being used as temples, but most often, instead of a full-fledged temple, they're using one of those niches as a pilgrimage site. They're not always fully operating the, the, as we've seen before. Now, this, this one on the left, which is in um, Ahmedabad, Mata Bhavani, that's from the same exact time period as uh, Rani Kival, the huge you know, UNESCO site, built at the same time. But Rani was obviously this big, showy, fancy well. The one on the right was a utilitarian well. It didn't have much decoration. But the community that grew up around it, uh, it was protected by the government. And technically, you're not allowed to encroach. You're not supposed to build your structures. You're not allowed to uh, change the structure in any way, even though you know, it's better to change them in a lot of cases. And they just decided. No, we want to use this well. And so they took it over and just tchotchkeed it up with all of these, you know, like there's lights in it. There's all of these kind of vulgar but fabulous statues, and they're always adding more to it. It's the most vibrant, active place. When you go in, you can hear the bells. You can smell the um, incense. And it's exactly how it would have been experienced. That is the, the closest you can come to an actual living step well from, you know, a millennium ago. On the right is an important step, or more important than Mata Bhavani. And it is, I don't, it's just, it doesn't even matter where it is. It's nowhere that anybody's going to go. And so there's no reason to restore it. Nobody's going to see it. The people in the community couldn't give a hoot about it. We're following me all over the place. But look at the difference, because these are almost identical looking. Why protect these and keep people out of them or changing them if it ends up like the one on the right? The government, when I was talking to an ASI archaeological survey guy about Mata Bhavani, he said, yeah, you know, we have to go in there and just take all that sculpture off because you're not allowed to do it. It was like, would, you're crazy. Why? So it can end up like the one on the right. Hopefully they haven't done it. I haven't been there for a couple of years. Here's another example of one on the left. Who knows what that step well is? It could be the earliest step well in India for all we know. But because it's still an active temple and they just plastered it over and painted it and it's it's cool. Like it's a very active place compared to the one in Donk, which nobody will ever see. Is that a bad thing? I don't know. My ideas of conservation have changed 100% since I started going and would admonish, but take care of your well. It's like, why? Why should we take care of it? We don't care about it. There's still active pilgrimage sites. This is a fantastic step well that is protected. Um, also in a tiny village in Gujarat, where it was, there's a great story. This is one of the ghost deity stories, where there was a ghost, a monster, that was coming down and murdering and eating the denizens of this town, of Badla. And finally, the deity Gelmata, who is an aspect of the mother goddess, you know, that's who gives you children, um, came down and said, okay, you better stop this or I'm going to kill you. And he said, I mean, how do you kill a ghost? But that's just part of the fun. And he wouldn't. So she killed him. And he came back to life as a good 
ghost. And he said, what can I do to make up for being a bad ghost? And she said, you can build this stuff. Well, and he built it overnight. They're always built overnight. And so people come from all over to drink that water. And you see them giving it to their babies. And this is blessed water. And the site is kept up very well. But that's not the water I would want to drink. But when you come back up from the well, um, Bobro, Bobro was the bad ghost who started all of this, was evil, turned good. And you go right past this shrine to him where people leave, um, not alcohol, because they would never do that, but like lit cigarettes because he liked to smoke. <laughs> you still see a lot of these being used for irrigation when there's water, that's great. Um, I used to think, God, you're ruining that 15th century well by putting in tubes. And now I think, oh, great, use the water. They're even being used in this case for habitation. This is an, one of the most impressive step wells. It was a private well for Raja Bir Singh, uh, Dev. This is in Madhya Pradesh. So this would have been for his court. It's outside in the countryside. But this huge, grandiose entryway is just an amazing looking thing that's, uh, you know, obviously this is going to topple. There are beautiful, rich um, crops around it. I think they're growing mustard seed. And I walked in, and there's a family living there. They live inside it. I mean, there's room. It's better than a lot of, you can see it's very clean. And uh, they were really scared when I showed up because they thought that, well, they kept saying, we were given this. We have a deed. This has been in our family for generations. I'm like, you know, I almost didn't put it in the book because I was afraid. There's another one I'm afraid of, too, that um, maybe they could get into trouble. Maybe they could get evicted. I really hope not. But um, there's still plenty of water, and they still irrigate, and they're just using it. They're using it. The point is, it's being used. I want to show you a typical step well hunt. Um, this is this driver of mine. The drivers just cannot comprehend what I'm doing. I don't know these guys. They're just like assigned to me by some a tour group. And when I start, just they don't even know what I'm talking about. But usually by the end of the trip, they're taking pictures of these two, which to me is the most rewarding thing. They're like, OK, let me take a picture of that. I'm going to send it to my wife. So you get over and you, you pull over, and the guy's like, yeah, 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 I know that step up. Well, OK, you go straight. Then you go that way. Then you go that way. Then you go up. <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's why you drive away for, around for hours. And sometimes you don't find anything. Sometimes you find a pond. Sometimes you find something amazing. And sometimes you drive by something totally different that is also amazing. In this case, I was looking for this, which is outside of Delhi. This is one of the latest step wells built. Nothing is known about it, but the, uh, the local architectural society has ascribed the date of 1903, which is so specific. And I said, what did you come up with that? And nobody's given me that reason. That's very specific. It's just trashed. And um, when I was there last year, it, apparently bulldozers were actually knocking down part of it to build a road. And the local university, where I was also giving a lecture, uh, the, the students had raised this huge protest and stopped the bulldozers. It was in the newspaper for days. And they asked me, would I sign a petition? And of course, I did. But then in the course of my lecture, I said, OK, great. You've saved us now. So how many of you are going to clean it next week? Not a hand went up. How many of you are going to like keep it going? Nobody. And this, I admonish them. And this is something which is really important, is that it's up to the communities to keep these things going. And if the community isn't going to get involved, it's just going to look like that. But one of the things that is interesting is when step wells come into, uh, and I'm almost done with this, uh, step wells can influence contemporary culture in ways that are really, well, a lot are great. One is hideous. But here, Charles Correa, the famous Anglo-Indian British architect who did incorporate stepwell designs into a lot of his work. Sanjay Puri, he won an award for this project. 
uh, even though it's unbuilt. It's, it's a kind of a reservoir in Rajasthan. Or people repurpose their step wells. This is one of the greatest things I've ever gone to. It's a dinner in the step well night at a fantastic um, little hotel between Jodhpur and uh, Udaipur um, that used to be a hunting lodge. And they have this gorgeous old step well. I th think it's old. I think it's like 14th century. They have no information about it. But they have turned it into this evening experience that is one of the most romantic, fantastic evenings I've ever spent, unfortunately by myself, with all these happy, romantic couples nearby. I'm like, this is great. <laughs> um, this is a case of uh, one of the steples that is being refurbished by INTAC, which is a fantastic organization that grew up in opposition to the archeological survey because they were doing such a disastrous job. Um, they did a book, the only book, extant book, on Steples in a city, which is on my reading list, um, all about Bundi, the city of Stepwells. And they found a significant Stepwell in this town of Bundi, where I've seen dozens, and um, worked with the community to restore it, to clean it, to use it. Um, they even put in gutters in the community, which is fairly middle class. And they hired local artists to paint it. And it's, it's really a beautiful thing. But within a year, already people are not keeping it up. Another thing that's really great is in Jodhpur, in a public-private project with the Maharaja of Jaipur, who's very, um, what is that? Very um, water conservation minded, and there are a lot of step well preservation projects going on. It's not a step well, but it uses the same clans of artisans who were building all of those step wells a thousand years ago. It's a water um, reclamation cistern project that recycles the gray water in this upscale um, gated community. Okay. Oh. Have you been reading about this? In the New York Times vessel in the Hudson Yards, $200 million was supposed to cost $160 million based on a step well designed by Heatherwick Studios, who I've otherwise admired. And two years ago, when this thing appeared in the newspapers, like, oh, Hudson Yards, and I was just appalled. Like, there's so many great things you could do with step well design, and this? It, which is now open to the public as of two weeks ago. I wrote to Heatherwick Studios and said, oh, you know, that looks like it was based on Chon Bowery or one of the other step wells. Um, it's a stairway to nowhere. You just climb all the way up and hope that nobody takes a dive off of it. I think it's a, like a suicide magnet. You know, just <laughs> other people think that too. It's like so dangerous. You have to buy tickets for it or, or book a ticket. Um, and they had no idea about history of step wells, nothing. I have been pitching to different newspapers the idea of how about since this thing has gotten a lot of attention and in every article it says influenced by Indian step wells, but never a definition or a photograph of a step well. This is the kind of thing that drives me insane. But the last thing I want to show is what can happen when somebody does put time and money into a step well in their community and how it can transform the life of that community. This is in Jodhpur. I was walking by this place one day. I thought, okay, that's a step well. You can tell, you can just tell after a while there's steps, this kind of pavilion. Stinking, disgusting place. The people that owned it actually own a fantastic little um, hotel right back there, the Ross Hotel. And they decided, it's a fairly prominent family, to create a trust. They didn't know anything really about this, except it was from the 18th century. Uh, they decided, we got to get rid of that. Like, let's see what's under there. It's disgusting. And they're, they carted off like 500 truckloads of this, 300 years of the most disgusting trash. And today, it looks like this. <laughs> And it has become a center of the community. It's number three on TripAdvisor of the place to go see. The area around it is called Stepwell Square. Wonderful restaurants and shops. And they created a 
the Stepwell uh, room over it in their hotel, which is gorgeous. Like if you go to Jodhpur, forget the Umayyad Bhavan Palace, that huge pile. Stay at the Ross. They gave me that room when I went there last time because I put this in my book. And I wouldn't stay there because it was off on its own. It's this huge palatial thing. I'm like, me? I don't want to stay there alone. But it, it's an example of what can happen if a community where people go, what if you put some time and money into it, it is transformative. Now, this is the show that opens next month of my photographs from the little stupid camera to this at the Fowler Museum at UCLA, which is the most marvelous museum. I'm sure a lot of you have gone there, but they have the most beautiful little visual culture show. So next time you go to LA, very easy to get to, it's free. And I couldn't be happier to be having that show there. It's up for a long time. And the last picture is, this was from like one of my first forays into the Stepwells. This is at Nimrana, where I fell in love with Stepwells to the point of obsession. But I was so scared, as I mentioned, of falling down into that maw I used to go and dress in these Indian things, but now people look at me like I'm a freak, so they're all wearing jeans. Um, I don't do that anymore, but at the time it was really fun. And I asked my driver to take this picture of me smiling in case I died. <laughs> and I wanted my son to have one last photograph of me happy, <laughs> uh, which I am. And thank you so much. I will answer any questions.